you ever like something and then go back to it a few years later and it's just it doesn't hold up at all how many of you have experienced that now i've experienced that a lot because i cover a lot of stuff that came out in the distant past but one of the things that i kind of really solidified this for me was mega man 7. Now i remember mega man 7 fondly I used to play it with my cousins and used to replay it regularly and do challenge modes and all sorts of other fun stuff. I used to play the heck out of it. And then I was like, all right, it was actually one of the earliest games we did when we started the Classic Run concept for this very show years ago. We went through and went through with analysis mode, and we were like, oh. 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 And the funny thing is, after that fact, I found out that it's considered common consensus amongst the, the video gaming Mega Man speedrunning community. Uh, so kind of three communities and broad kind of meshing in the middle there, that Mega Man 7 and Mega Man 8 both kind of battle it out for being the bad classic Mega Man. And it was just such a, a culture shock, but it made perfect sense. After all, why I enjoyed it back in the day was because it was Mega Man and because it was, at that point in time, the only classic Mega Man I had. I may have told this story before, but uh, someone who shall go nameless forced me to sell all of my NES cartridges. So I didn't have one through six. I had seven. And the X's, obviously. But you get the idea. So that's, yeah, that's all it really had going for it, was it was my only exposure to classic Mega Man. It was all I had, not exposure. It was, it was the only one I had access to. So, okay, sure. And having said all that, you've probably already garnered my opinion on Zero One. But the thing is, I don't remember liking Zero One all that much. I always remembered Zero One as kind of a weird awkward sort of a game that was clearly a first foray by people who didn't really know what they were doing yet, tried some interesting stuff, and then, you know, got better in Zero Two and Zero Three and Zero Four and ZX and ZX2. Although, you, we'll talk about that later, obviously. But on the gameplay axis, my god, like, there's some really good stuff here. That's, that's what bothers me the most. If this game had had time to cook and bake and really find itself, I think this would actually be a great game. This did something that the Mega Man series in general hadn't done arguably ever, but certainly not since X1. It varied up the formula. Sure, there's the stages, and you can do them in relatively any order, but only kind of. You only have access to the top three at any even point in time. And the stages themselves, there's a bit of a repeat of terrain, which was as near as I can tell a memory issue. I'm not 100% on that, though, so don't, I shouldn't even say that. I'm not sure what the actual reason is. But either way, there's some repeats of the stages, which changes how the stage is. Because you can go back to a stage pretty much at any time. But if you go back to a stage, you go back to it in the latest stage that it was. So if you go through the desert the first time, and then you go back to there, you can go back to that first format. But if you face the second desert level, then now it's the second desert level, and so forth and so on. That's kind of a cool concept, but the stages themselves also varied things up a bit. Having a stage where you fight the boss right at the beginning of the stage, and then move on to go and try and defuse some bombs, or having a stage where you have to try and investigate what's going on in this underwater facility, or having a stage where you're just fighting against this huge swarm of enemies that are coming at you, you can feel how they tried to vary the format up, and I'm with that completely. If... I liked Mega Man 11, don't mistake me, and I did. It's actually the highest rated Mega Man game I've reviewed so far. We'll see if we'll surpass that when we get to the X's and the classics. But it didn't, it was very, very Mega Man, right? It was just classic, no changes, no nothing. It was just your standard thing. And I really do feel like there's quite a bit that can be done to vary up the series, which was done in Zero One. <laughs> what? But there's so many things hampering it. Going back to a stage, like I just mentioned before, you play the hub music while you're doing it. The whole stage. Now, if you don't know the hub music, it's either a one measure of four units or two measures of four and four. It's about a five-second loop. Over and over and over and over while going back and trying to find items you missed or trying to grind yourself. Oh, yeah, Spidey, speaking of it, there's grinding in this game, in a Mega Man game. The game keeps track of how many enemies you hit with your sword or your blaster or your spear. Or your, I don't remember what it does for the shield. And each time you hit, it, it counts up a counter and you can slowly level up the weapon up to a total of like seven or five or whatever. And it'll show that on the screen. It'll show that on the, the main menu exactly how far you are in any given leveling thing. That's not a bad concept. 
having something that allows you to change and morph how you attack is actually a cool concept. This, however, is just grindy. Especially since it's very easy to reach a point where it actually becomes aggravating to grind. If you go too far into the thing, the state of the stages change, and the two best uh, leveling spots in the game for that both go away if you get too far into it. So that's great. Uh, as I usual, I don't like to criticize without critiquing, so here's what I would do. Make it so that each boss you defeat gives you a chip. Now, there's a lot of ways you could execute this, but the general idea is you attach a chip to a weapon that makes the weapon better. Now, the ideal for me personally would, and this is getting into a little bit more development time and a little bit more work, but the chips don't make the weapons do more damage. They make the weapons operate differently. Uh, a blaster that shoots through enemies, so, you know, it has pass-through, or maybe that shoots multiple shots out, or it has like a wave effect kind of a thing, you know, kind of like the the Spazer in the Metroid series, or maybe something that will leave uh, an, a dot on a boss, or maybe something that can allow you to attack in an upwards arc with your sword, or stuff like that, right? Add these mutators on, and then you probably have so many slots that each weapon can have, and so you each boss, you just attach this mutator to this, or this mutator to this, and that allows you... And of course, ideally, you'd be able to slot them back out and slot in new ones at will. This would basically allow you to... to this would add builds to a, to a Mega Man game, and it would basically allow you to... What did I say basically? It's such a stupid line. I try not to do that. I apologize. My dad gets me on that all the time for saying that. It, when I say basically, what I'm doing is pausing to process my next sentence. It's the same as saying, uh... But I try really hard not to say, uh... So instead I say basically, I apologize. The idea would be that you have introduced builds to the game, and because you can swap it in and out on, on the fly, probably whenever you're out of combat, or maybe just at the beginning of the mission if we want to limit it, that means you can try different methods of going through specific stages. It also means you're not limited, you're not locked into this one leveling style, so to speak. You can say, you know what, I want to try out the blaster for where I'm... You know, I wonder how the spear operates. And it allows you to do that without having to go and, you know, grind... There's an escort quest in this game. This is another thing that could have been actually kind of interesting. Uh, it's not because this is a Ninja Gaiden game and the enemies respawn the moment you get off the screen in several cases. And you have to escort this guy who stops following you if you get further than five feet in front of him and you have to go back again. So you can't clear ahead. You have to follow with him. So he's in danger all the time. He does have very little health and also so do you. So that's fun. And you see how it comes so close to being good. I'm not going to go down every single item in the list, but there's a lot of ideas here that really tried to vary it up and kind of failed. But all of that I could forgive if not for the camera. Now, anybody who's played GBA games knows that this is a huge problem with platformers on the GBA. Some games kind of get around this. Some games mitigate it a little bit. But a lot of platformers on the GBA have the... The camera problem. The camera is zoomed in too far, is really what it boils down to. And this is partially due to hardware limitations of the GBA itself. But no matter what the reason is, the result is that we are staring like we're, we're so zoomed in that at multiple points you literally can't see the enemies that are already there and see you and are ready to attack you. It's actually worse than that in some cases. My personal favorite is on the bomb defusal level. You have to get up to get this one bob in this one ledge. While you're up here, the camera moves up with you. Now, there's these slowly moving platforms going by you underneath, right? It's actually guys holding up giant girders, but whatever. So they're flying by, and you can't see them at all. You cannot see when it's safe to jump down. The only way to do that is to very carefully wall hop off of the edge and then wall hop up to get like a brief glimpse of where they are at and then use that in order to judge your thing. That's just one example, but there are dozens throughout this game of this of this extreme limitation of camera being a constant ha 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 what starts with a ha harassment no harangment a suckitude with regards to the game design. Nowhere is this more evident than the final boss. Now, most of the boss fights in this game are actually kind of inventive and interesting, and I'll actually give you that one game rather than you know. Flame Dude Face or Flame Man, we have this random machine thing. And there's some good variety to the bosses. We've got the machine that, you know, kind of rotates uh, and, and it's got the pieces that come down and attack you with the different elements. And every time one of the pieces is up, it gets regenerated, a new piece gets put in. That's clever. That's interesting. Um, we've got a lot of the mini bosses, like the Spinny Attack guy, who's, who's effectively Top Man, too. Or we've got. Um, 
Gosh, of course, I can't think of any others now. There are several examples. of There are standard bosses, too, but there's a lot of effort made in actually making the bosses interesting and fun, and that's awesome. Um, the tutorial boss is probably the second hardest boss in the entire game. <laughs> Make of that what you will. But then we get to the final boss. Now, the first final boss is actually pretty fun. He's got a varied move set. He can change which element he has equipped, which not only changes his weakness, but also makes it so that he has different different attacks. And, and I don't just mean like different, you know, I mean like the actual, he has the same type of attacks. He has a, a shot, he has a lunge, he has a slide, and then he has the dash in the air. But each of those change as mutators, like I was talking about as an idea for us earlier, based on which element he has equipped. That's awesome. That's such a cool idea. Then there's phase two, which you fight immediately after without any pause to get health back or anything like that after the first phase. Problem number one. Problem number two, each time you die, you have to see the whole cutscene each time over and over. That's problem number two. Problem number three. Now, I know there's an asterisk attached to that, but bear with me. Problem number three is that you get to fight him and the platforms around you go away. So you're just on this one platform and it's just bottomless pit over there. Now, having a bottomless pit in a boss already kind of sucks. Gate, Mega Man X6, hello. But this sucks even more, and this is the best part. So he has three attacks. One just hits the whole area of the platform. Hits like a truck, by the way. One is he shoots some random lasers out and hope you have the shield, because it's optional to get, and if you don't, well, there's no real way to dodge that. But it'll knock you over the edge, and it'll also prevent you from going on the platforms that are going side by side, up and down, which are spikes, of course, but you can wall jump on them. And then he's got something that roots you in place, which if he hits you anywhere in the air, you're just instantly dead because he'll drag you down to the depths. Those are his three attacks. That's it. That's all. He doesn't even have that much HP. But what really makes this fight suck so hard, in addition to the fact that his hurt box is actually, in some cases, larger than his hit box, which means you have to get hit to hit him, which is just all kinds of nonsense, if you get knocked over the edge, you're dead. Well, you'd be like, but you, you can just wall jump up. No, you can't. Because what it is, and I'm going to try to describe I'm going to use the, the case of the game here, because we're playing on the Switch, so... This is the platform, right? So if you get knocked over the edge, you have so little room to recover that you are dangling off of the edge of it because it does, it has a bottom. And it, and if you've played this game, you know that the wall jump mechanics are really wonky when you get down on a plat on a box like this. You get like one chance and that's it. You can't really recover and hop back up and get back up top. If it had been like this where it had more depth, so this is the actual kill plane right here, but you can actually hop your way up because there's platform here. That one tiny change would make this boss substantially more manageable. Getting rid of the pit would make it more manageable. Turning the pit into instant kill spikes would make it more manageable. Why? Because instant kill spikes don't kill you if you have iframes, if you've just been hit. So if you get hit and knocked into the spikes, you can recover. But there is no recovery. And then you have to do the whole cutscene and the first phase of the fight over and over and over again. It's garbage. And that's this game in a nutshell. Not the garbage part. <laughs> that's too unkind. This game is reaching for greatness and failing consistently at it. Except on the narrative side of things. I never thought we'd reach the day where a Mega Man game would rate higher on the story axis than the gameplay, but here we are! <laughs> for those of you who don't actually click the, the reviews down in the link there, or watch the streams, or watch the reviews, or check the website for the reviews, or check the spreadsheet for the reviews... The reviews are everywhere, is what I'm trying to say. Review, review, review. For those of you who don't check any of that stuff, this scored a plus four to story, but not negative four to gameplay, net. And there's all sorts of things that go into that. I'm not going to bore you with it right now, because all those reviews are there. But what in the world? But the story was actually surprisingly well done. There's a lot of visual storytelling, which is something the Mega Man series has always excelled at. That's where the, we talked about that with Bloodborne just a bit ago, where the, the, the place where you fight the enemy or the background of the enemy or the animations of how you're fighting them tell a story, right? They give you information on what's going on and why. And we're fighting our way through these ruins and this desert, which is filled with all these giant machines of war that are broken down and just started sinking into the sand. And we get a vibe for the conflict that's currently going on and exactly how damaging it has been, how many ruins and, and destruction it has caused. And then we hit Neo Arcadia, which is pristine. It's It's got this Neo-Olympian look. That's not the actual term, but someone in chat said it, and it's a great idea. Um, it, it's got the Greek Greco kind of like pillars of marble, right? But circuitry built into it. Like, like the doors are just chunks of marble that move up and down and just cool stuff like that. And it's pristine and beautiful. And you look into the distance and you see paradise. And that's just 
brilliant visual storytelling. In addition to that, there's a surprisingly large amount of world building going on here. Uh, there's several examples of this. We could talk about the destroyed biosphere, or we could talk about the fact that this is effectively the post-apocalypse. Maybe the fact that a major plot point is the fact that they keep trying to find another energy source. You're probably thinking, how is that, a, how is that world building? Well, because of the nature of how reploids function within this setting, this and we're kind of drifting into narrative here, so spoilers, by the way, um, they need a specific type and a specific amount of energy in order to operate. That's their food, right? And the only real source of that is Neo-Arcadia. That's the chain around the neck there. You can leave Neo-Arcadia anytime you want to. I mean, granted, it's a wasteland out there because the biosphere of Earth has been nuked after Mega Man X5, but you could leave and try to start and build something else. You're a reploid. You could probably survive out there. But you'd run out of energy. And so they have this huge plot point, which revolves around several stages, around just trying to find a new energy source. How about the one old man we talked to? And he admits, and this is, this is one of the few bits of good, most of the dialogue in this game is really badly written. It's, it's what I call empty text, where someone talks for multiple sentences and either says nothing or very little. It's, it's something I absolutely despise in dialogue writing. This guy does the exact opposite of that. This old man, isn't that the beginning of a song? He briefly mentions as, as just normal dialogue that he happens to be a reploid. And he says it so smoothly, you wouldn't even notice it unless you're paying attention. And then he mentions that he found a woman who was a singer, and he felt entranced by her singing, felt compelled to talk to her afterwards, and the two of them actually fell in love. Now, that's already kind of awesome and heartwarming, but you're probably thinking, hang on, he's an old man reploid. Well, what happened is she grew old because she was human. And you see where this is going. He actually had himself altered and changed his body to have the appearance and styles of an old man for her. And she's been dead for years upon years upon years because she was human and he's a reploid, but he retains his old man body in memory of her. That one scene speaks volumes. The very idea of the fact that a reploid and a human can fall in love, about the fact that there can be reciprocal feelings there, about the fact that the society exists so that's acceptable, about the fact that the reploids can alter their bodies pretty much at will to accommodate whatever needs they have as long as they have access to the resources at hand, the fact that the reploids live for basically forever as long as they get the energy and, uh, and, and supplies and upgrades and maintenance, whereas the humans will eventually die out. And we've got it's just, There's so much that's told with that one little story, and that's only one of those stories. It's weird how much world building there is going on in this game. Now, I will say this game does have one pretty big narrative flaw other than the text issue, and that's the tone. Now, I said this already on stream, but I'm going to repeat it here. The Mega Man series is light and happy and silly, and Dr. Wily isn't really evil. The Mega Man X series is 90s. Now, I'm okay with that because 90s can be done well. It blew up Alex mentioned this on chat, for example. But it is still obviously an attempt to be more edgy and 90s and extreme. I mean, it's called Mega Man X, for God's sakes. So Sigma is actually a little bit more cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. He's a little bit more psychopathic and actually wants to exterminate humanity and kill most of the Mavericks. And the Maverick disease, uh, the Maverick virus, literally turns you into a rabid, raving, violent monster, right? But then we get to the Zero series. This is after the apocalypse. So this is officially a post-apocalypse. And the only surviving patch of land, and there's actually other bits we find out in the future, but the only surviving patch of land where anyone can survive is this one city, Neo-Arcadia, the one place where humans and reploids can continue to exist. And even here, there's this oppressive overlord, Master X, yeah, spoilers, who's running around trying to go ahead and uh, la label and mislabel people as mavericks. Keep in mind the maverick virus as an existence has been gone for a long time. So nowadays, the term maverick is just being used as a label to t get rid of anybody that the master does not agree with. Political overtones, political overtones. And you see how it gets a little bit into the darkier and edgier territory. And we're going to be seeing more of that as we go through the rest of the Zero series. And I admit this doesn't quite gel with me as well as the X series. I think it goes too far in several respects. I mean, this is a pretty bloody game overall for a GBA game. But that makes sense, since this was something Inafune was really pushing, and if you don't know this, 
Inafune certainly leaned in that direction. After all, he was one of the original brainchilds behind DMC DMC. That's actually a much more complicated story that I'm making out to sound. You can look it up otherwise. But I'm just saying, you can see the man's leanings with regards to game design. Moving on. I suppose I should mention a few other things while we're here. As we're going through these, we'll mention some little anecdotes uh, on both ruminations on the stream. So Mega Man Zero One is entirely an establishment game. It could have been a standalone. It turns out that Copy X is, surprise, a copy. This actually isn't even a plot twist in this game. It's revealed pretty early on that this is not the actual X. We do meet the actual X, who at this point is a cyber elf. The simplest way to explain a cyber elf is they are a program which exists within the cyber verse. Within the Mega Man setting, this is true in Mega Man Battle Network as well as in Mega Man Zero and Mega Man ZX, there's the physical plane and then there's the digital plane. And the both both coincide and coexist pretty universally. So anything running around the digital verse has a pretty large ability to affect the physical and vice versa. So the two are kind of congruent. But cyber elves live exclusively within the cyber verse. They're on that layer of things. Most cyber elves are designed to run themselves. They are a program. They run and then they terminate. It's effectively deleting the program to do it. Now this is a gameplay conceit more than it is a narrative one. They are consumables, potions that you can use. Whether that's a good thing or not is up to your opinion. Uh, certainly, that's kind of a, a questionable thing. I'm not even talking about how grindy it is to level them up. We think I think we already got across of just exactly how grindy this game could be. You have to raise 1,200 crystals to make one sub tank. 1,200. They actually lower this number substantially in later zero games because somebody somewhere was like, "Whoa!" Anyways, <clears throat> narrative, right? So. That's what Cyber Elves are, and that's what X is now. He is now existing entirely in the cybernetic side of things. He's tired. He's so tired. He's been fighting against evil for forever. He just wants a rest. And now that Zero's up, Zero's like, okay, sure, I'll take up the risk. And so Zero goes, fights Copy X, defeats most of the Guardians, kills one of the Guardians, that'd be Phantom. And then they just, you know, they've kind of settled things, and they've got a bright spot of hope, and they have a future ahead of them. Yay! Kind of sits on its own. But obviously the series will continue, which we'll be covering starting tomorrow. There's some other things I could talk about. Copy X clearly has such a huge, huge amount of self-esteem issues. One of the most consistent character traits for Copy X is how he insists that he is as good as, in some cases, better than the original X. And he is constantly told and shown that he's not. And he doesn't take that too well. No, I built this. I built Paradise. I did what X never could. Yeah, you, you kind of get the vibe there. Which is funny, considering going back all the way back to the original, that Dr. Wily himself started all of this because of the fact that he didn't really have a large amount of self-esteem. If you really think about it, and I'll mention this, I've mentioned this in stream, I'll mention this in future videos probably, the entire Mega Man series, uh, excuse me, the, the four main Mega Man series from Classic to X to Z to ZX, all of them all started and all are effectively about a feud between Dr. Light and Dr. Wily, something that was continuing in ZX, and we'll never continue because they canceled that series. Thanks very much for that, Capcom. Can we have Mega Man again? Can we have some good Mega Man? I know we've got 30 XDX coming. One of the biggest flaws of the story is there's no real characterization. Tell me Seal's character in a nutshell. Or Zeros, or X's, or anybody's. They're all one-note characters at best. There's some good world building, and there's some good establishment, but there's not a lot of actual depth to most of what's going on. And that, I think, is the biggest flaw in the narrative, like I was mentioning earlier. That's actually all I got. These are going to be really short ruminations. That's fine. I got a lot of things to do. I will probably be releasing one rumination video per video, per game. I'm not 100% committed to that because we are doing Mega Man Z 1 through 4, Mega Man 1 through 6, and Mega Man X 1 through 3. That's a lot of videos. We'll see. I do hope you've enjoyed at least my initial thoughts. I'll see you next time.